and I have Matt Pryor here. Uh, we are from a company called Stack HPC, and today we're going to talk about what we do with compute platforms, um, platforms as a service in, as opposed to infrastructure, um, particularly for the scientific computing use cases. Uh, but I don't think anything we're going to cover is particularly specific to that domain, it's just the domain in which we work in. So we have been working together in our company on an open source project uh, called Azimuth, which um, has been developed by a, a lab in the UK, and we have been working to, to further and develop, develop that system and make it into a very nice sort of self-service platform for various types of compute platform systems. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the uh, particular use cases and, um, and also a little bit about sort of some of the really cool things in it that I think are quite distinctive and, and certainly worth, um, worth a little bit of extra time on. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end. So you probably won't have heard of our company um, unless you're in this domain, in the niche that, uh, that we work in. Uh, we're actually about 25 people um, based in the UK, uh, Poland, and France. And, um, and the company was formed about six years ago um, in order to um, work in this space of public domain scientific cloud infrastructure. And, um, and I think we, we started out to do this, and we've been doing it for six years. And I think it's been, uh, been going very well so far. So um, everything we do uh, pretty much is, is open source and in an open community. Um, and Azimuth is, is, is no, no different to that. So you might think, well, what, why would we do this? Uh, why would we need to do this? Why would we want to think about doing this? And I guess part of the reason for that is, is this concept of um, dynamic high-performance computing. So this is what some people call like sort of the next generation of high-performance computing or, or just research computing in general. And the idea is that um, uh, we start to use OpenStack infrastructure, uh, software-defined infrastructure, in order to compose compute platforms uh, for the scientists and the end users that we serve, uh, simply to give a little bit more flexibility in terms of the kind of platforms that we can offer. So conventionally, historically, um, Providers of research computing services, like universities and institutions, generally tended to serve a fairly sort of fixed range of functions, uh, such as batch queued environments or uh, general sort of um, high performance computing runtime systems. And that's no longer true um, because of things like machine learning and the sort of explosion of life sciences and, and other faculties within research institutions who who need completely different platforms. Uh, we have to, or, or institutions have to provide this kind of flexibility. So you get this idea that upon our software-defined infrastructure, which is where things like OpenStack and Ceph come in, uh, we start to provide a rich ecosystem of science platforms and actual sort of software on top of those. And we have to be able to do that usually with the same people. So an HPC services group or a computing services group now gets stretched really far. So it might look something like this. And, um, and so we can see straight away that there is a lot of trouble coming in here because we have um, a huge explosion in sort of the breadth of environments that we might want to provide. We might need to provide a Kubernetes environment and a Slurm environment, and that's, you know, that's standard. Um, People, often, people always expect this, actually, within their OpenStack infrastructure when they're looking at cloud computing. So how do we provide all of these different environments on a single common infrastructure substrate uh, without burning out our, the people in the team? And so they're, they're, this is where we have to bring in things like uh, uh, cloud-native automation techniques. And, um, and this is the kind of system that Azimuth uh, provides for us. So I think, um, in particular, we're going to be focusing on uh, this piece. So Azimuth is it's sort of limits of its jurisdiction is this red box here. And I'm going to hand over to Matt now to talk about some of the other motivations. Cool. Thanks, Stig. Uh, so yeah. So. 
what we want to do is basically get researchers doing their science as quickly as we can. Um, but the researchers, they don't, they're not, they're asking for different kinds of platforms than they used to now. They, they want to use the best platform for their workflow. Um, but you know, they don't want to be a sysadmin. They don't want to be a networking expert. They don't want to be waiting but they also don't want to sacrifice the performance that comes with a specialized system. And as an operator, what we want to do is um, not incur a heavy support burden of having to manually deploy these systems every time, um, but we still want to keep our infrastructure up to date or at least help our users um, keep their, keep, help our users keep their own infrastructure up to date by making it easy. Um, so we came to the conclusion that the ideal solution is kind of more opinionated than infrastructure as a service, but less opinionated than platform as a service. So um, more flexible and dynamic. We want to be flexible and dynamic and be able to offer these platforms on demand. So um, I actually used to work for a facility called Jasmine before I worked for Stack HPC, and they have an open stack community cloud. Um, where they've successfully established this pattern of on-demand platforms, and we've been building on this work. Um, so what Azimuth provides is a simple self-service portal that you give research. The idea is that you're able to give researchers direct access to this portal for them to manage their own cloud resources. Um, and it has platforms as a first-class citizen, but the available platforms are curated by the cloud operator. So you're, you, you the operator retains some control. Um, and these platforms are optimized for HPC and AI use cases in the, in the uh, deployments that we have done so far. Um, but there's, like Stig said, there's nothing particularly HPC specific about the system. Um, and access to these platforms is streamlined using an application proxy that we've developed called Zenith. And this allows us to uh, expose services without consuming a whole load of floating IPs, actually. So it's, um, which is a quite often a limited resource in the clouds that we work on. Um, we're currently targeting OpenStack clouds. We'd like to target other, other clouds in hybrid scenarios and, and things like that. And the developments that we've done as Stack HPC have been funded by the IRIS collaboration so far. And so like, we, like we've both said, the overall aim is to reduce the time to science and reduce the operational burden of onboarding and supporting users for the operator as well. And so I'm just going to walk through a few of the uh, use cases that we've got. So the first use case is the one we like to call bigger laptop. Uh, so this is a researcher has some code they've developed on their laptop. They need access to a machine with specialist hardware. Um, they just want to get to that machine really easily. So we've really stripped down the machine creation dialog from Horizon, uh, literally just a name, an image, and a size. And then we've also added this option to enable a, a, a web console access, which isn't VNC. So, <laughs> um, so what, what that does is they creates a machine, eventually becomes available. You get access to this option in the dropdown. Uh, note that there's no external or floating IP associated with any of this. Um, and then you click on that link, eventually the web console becomes available. Uh, you'll notice it has a funky uh, domain. This is a, a Zenith application proxy endpoint. And then from here, and Zenith will also handle things like TLS termination for us, so that's nice. And then eventually the user gets into their remote desktop. So this is a web desktop. They also can have access to a web console. And this is a machine that has their GPU or whatever it is that they wanted. So how did we do that? So Azimuth is, there's nothing special about Azimuth. It's just an open stack client that authenticates with the credentials that the user gives it. Um, we provision machines with some extra metadata. And we ship a bunch of images that um, know how to, add, how to deal with that metadata to do different things. And one of those is start up, the guac, start up a Guacamole web console and then register the machine with Zenith. And by the time it's done all that, the user gets to access their machine through the web browser without consuming a floating IP using the application proxy. So. 
Uh, the next use case we've targeted is the sort of um, dedicated slurm cluster. So the recent, the use, an example of a use case we might see here is, you know, maybe the site does have a, a big HPC, um, but the queue times are long, or they need some specialist packages, or their work is real time, and they don't want to wait in a queue. Um, but they do want a batch cluster to execute an MPI code or something, uh, but they have a cloud allocation that they want to be able to make use of. So we have this system, which we call cluster as a service. Um, Slurm is the only appliance that we, as Stack HPC, maintain at the moment, but it's actually just, it, it's actually just Ansible, Playbooks, and Terraform. So it can support different cluster types. We only have Slurm at the moment. Um, but, and then once they've selected their cluster type, they get to set some options, um, and then click Create Cluster, goes away, makes the cluster, makes a bunch of machines, um, and then eventually the cluster becomes ready. You get access to the cluster details dialog, tells you how to access the cluster via SSH, if that's what you want to do. There's also some services that we have on the, on the Slurm clusters that are exposed again using Zenith. Um, so this is open on demand for people who've seen that before. It's uh, an interactive, uh, like a web interface for Slurm, managing Slurm jobs. Um, and we also present some cluster monitoring uh, so people can see what resources their jobs are using. Um, so yeah, again, how did we do that? So we're using Ansible, a bunch of open, open source technologies plugged together with a little bit of code, basically. So it's, we're using Ansible driven by AWX, which is the open source version of Tower. Um, we're using Terraform with the state stored in console. Our Slurm distribution is open HPC. We're using open on demand. And then the metrics are done using Prometheus and Grafana and Elasticsearch as well, actually, which isn't on this slide. Um, so the way it works is Azimuth makes inventories and jobs in AWX. That invokes an Ansible playbook, which invokes Terraform, which deploys the infrastructure. It's then adopted into the Ansible inventory, and then we configure it as a Slurm cluster. And like I said, the user can either access this via SSH, or they can use on-demand via our open on-demand via the Zenith application proxy. Um, and then the third case we, we, we've kind of targeted is uh, applications on Kubernetes. So the big one for us is, so far has been JupyterHub, and that's what everyone wants now. Uh, and so we wanted to make provisioning Kubernetes clusters easy. So the example use case here is a project wants to use Jupyter Notebooks for their data vis visualization. Um, they've got a cloud quota. They want to provision a JupyterHub. Maybe they want to use Dask. Um, maybe they want to mount some specialized storage, those kind of things. And so we've really, we present a simplified dialogue here. Um, there's a concept of a template, and the template is what defines the cluster version, the Kubernetes version, but it also can define um, other specialist things about the cluster. So for example, if you want SRIOV networking, that would be part of your template. And these templates are defined by the operator. So you can do things like tag, say you wanted SRI, an SRIOV network to be attached, you can tag a network in the project as providing SRIOV, and your template can say, use the network that's tagged for SRIOV for this cluster. And so we can do things, we can do high performance networking in these clusters without the user really having to worry about it, which is nice. Um, so you can have one or more node groups. The node groups can be auto-scaling. Um, and then you go away and you click Create Cluster. Oh, there's some add-ons as well, sorry. This, the point is, uh, OK, there we go. So you click, click Create Cluster, it goes away, makes the cluster. Um, that makes a bunch of machines. They all have funky names, but. Um, and then eventually the cluster becomes ready. Um, you can easily get hold of the kube config, copy it to the clipboard, download it, whatever you want to do. If you, um, one thing to note here actually is the the API end, the API endpoint is actually also a Zenith endpoint here. So we're not um, needing to consume a floating IP even for the API server to do this. 
Um, come on. And then in the cluster details page, you get obviously a bunch of information about the state of the cluster, but you also get um, a bunch of services accessible again via Zenith. You, know, you can probably see a pattern forming here. <laughs> and so these services are things like the Kubernetes dashboard, um, Grafana monitoring, and then that was Grafana in between. This isn't very responsive it anymore. So yeah, but that's the Grafana monitoring. And then the third thing which we're making available is the KubeApps application dashboard. So this comes from the Tanzu project. Um, and what this is is basically a user interface around Helm charts. So we pr can present a bunch of Helm charts to our, our users. We have a, a, we have a repository of Helm charts that we include by default, um, which have Zenith support integrated into them. And so they, the user can pick a, a Helm chart and they can configure it using a, a nice little form. Metadata goes with the Helm chart that defines what the form looks like. And then they can click deploy and in, uh, it goes away and it deploys the thing. And then eventually you get, an, again, another Zenith endpoint. Your Jupyter Hub comes up and you, uh, uh, the nice thing here, actually, is Zenith will also pass the, use, the OpenStack username of the authenticated user in the remote user header. And so we've configured JupyterHub to understand the remote user header. And so each OpenStack user actually gets authenticated as themselves when they get to JupyterHub, which means they get a separate notebook server, um, which is nice. So this is just demonstrating that it, it mounted our, our Lustre file system that we had um, and then this is like a, a noddy, expen expensive computation that I was using just to demonstrate auto-scaling. Uh, there is a video here. I don't know if we've got, how much time have we got? Enough. Enough. Can you press play on it then? Thank you. So this is just Dask. Um, so it starts off with one worker, and then we should see the auto-scaler push the cluster out. Um, by spawning new machines, and then eventually those machines become ready, and then the kubelet has to start up on them, and, red, and they have to be registered by, with OpenStack, but they have to have the initialization done by the OpenStack cloud provider, but they then become available as additional workers for Dask. And you can see just the, the computation just speeds up. And then once the computation's over, uh, the autoscaler is smart enough to uh, understand that it can scale those nodes back down again after maybe a, uh, after a, conf a configurable timeout, but by default, it's something like 10 minutes. Oh, we've done that. Ah. So again, how did we do that? So we're not using Magnum, actually, to do Kubernetes. We're using a project called Cluster API. Uh, which is like Kubernetes clusters inside Kubernetes clusters. Um, so what you do is you provision, you create Kubernetes resources inside a management cluster, which define your workload clusters. Um, and it uses all the standard tooling from the Kubernetes ecosystem, which is not something that Magnum does at the moment. So things like kubeADM is used to deploy the cluster. Um, and the other thing it does is uses an Im immutable infrastructure approach for upgrades. So upgrades are done by deleting nodes and replacing them with a new node, one by one in a rolling process. Um, and so we, by default, we have monitoring and logging with Prometheus, Grafana. We're using Loki to, for log collection. Um, and there's a Grafana dashboard that shows the Loki logs for the pods. Um, we're using like I said, the KubeApps application dashboard, which comes from Tanzu, um, and all these dashboards are available via Zenith. And like I said, um, we have support for GPUs, high-performance networking, and things like that. The, these are kind of use cases that this can facilitate uh, with that, transparently to the user as well. So, um, so the key to all of the key to a lot of the ease of use with this is, is Zenith which is this application proxy that we've developed. There's only one slide on here. Um, I keep promising this blog post, um, which I should definitely write. 
Um, but what, the, what Zenith is, is a, a tunneling HTTPS proxy. And what it does is allow us to expose services that are behind a NAT or a firewall without consuming floating IPs. And the exposed services only need to be bound to localhost. Uh, in fact, in some cases, we can do better than that and only bind them inside a pod, for example, for the Kubernetes services. And it performs TLS termination for the proxied services. It also pr provides authentication and, and project level authorization for the proxied services as well. Um, and this is all built using industry standard tooling with a small bit of glue code. So it's just SSH port forwarding, basically. We've got a locked down SSHD server that only uh, allows these tunnels to be established. And it runs inside Kubernetes, makes heavy use of the ingress, of the Nginx ingress controller. And we use a console to do some of the service discovery. Uh, but there will be a blog post about this soon. <laughs> Um, so, just summary and future plans, just a few things about where we're going with this. So, we hope that this is demonstrating that we're trying to lower the barrier uh, to get for researchers to get their science done, and we've got this deployed in a few places uh, where we're working with the research teams there to make sure that we're supporting their use cases effectively. Um, one of the main plans that we have is to have a first-class representation of the applications directly in Azimuth. So the piece that we're using Kube Apps for, we, we used Kube Apps because it got us where we wanted to go quickly, but we're kind of realizing that it doesn't quite fit with all of the use cases that we need. So by having a first-class representation of apps in Azimuth, we can do things like integrate intelligently with data sets and storage systems, which is one thing that our users want. And so they'll be able to do things like, say, I want a Jupyter Hub that has these two data sets available as mounts inside my pods, for example. That's the kind of thing that we're, we're, we're looking to target to do. Um, we can do, we want to be able to do the same seamless integration of the accelerated hardware that we do in Kubernetes with the Slurm clusters, which we can't quite do at the moment. And so we're talking about GPUs and SRIOV and RDMA, um, those kind of things. But there's a bit of operational hardening of the, of the platform itself that needs doing, so disaster recovery, monitoring, all the boring stuff. But the stuff which is critical if you're running it in production, right? And then, we, like I said before, we have a, an ambition to do some hybrid and public cloud stuff. And there's loads and loads and loads more ideas, but these are the main ones. And then just to say, come join us. Um, it's all open source software. Those are our repositories. We'd love to collaborate if you have access or to or, or are an operator of an OpenStack cloud. And this looks interesting to you, let us know. We'll we're happy to, to chat. We bug reports and especially patches are welcome, you know, um, and get in touch with us. There's our website. If you mm. come see us, we, we can give you more details. So. Just to Ooh. recap on a couple of things there. The, the user experience, they log into their platforms through a web portal. They authenticate once uh, to a university's ID pr provider or a, an open ID connect source. And then from that single point of um, interface, they can access all of their compute resources, which are otherwise not exposed to any public IPs by default. Um, for the operators, um, they get to avoid having an industry of tickets around creating new complete compute platforms for, for user requests. Uh, the self-service is defined by a series of Ansible repositories that are used to deploy the clusters uh, that are provided as an application catalog to the users. And, um, and perhaps from the security officer's point of view, um, there is only one um, uh, point of um, ingress into the system, uh, which is through the, um, uh, uh, through the Zenith application proxy um, through, uh, via Azimuth as well. So we think it brings a lot of useful features uh, to a system, and from our experience, this level of um, uh, self-service 
and yet with a sort of a, a steady hand over it to, uh, from the admin's point of view, in terms of um, prompting for maintenance and, um, and enabling uh, the users to, to keep their deployments up to date, but more importantly, out of, out of the public um, internet. You know. uh, these are all quite strong points that we think in favor of the way that this thing is working. Cool, so I think that was, that's all we wanted to say, so I hope we've got a bit of time for some questions, if anyone's got any questions. Mr. Heikkonen. Yeah, okay, so the, I think I'm paraphrasing a bit, but the question I think was basically how easy is it to add another cluster type if you've got pre existing Ansible playbooks for deploying a system? Is that? Yeah. yeah. So the way this works is um, basically the Ansible playbooks live in one or more Git repositories, these get added as projects in AWX. And then the, play, the individual playbooks get added as project templates. And then Azimuth is able to query the available cluster templates um, using the AWX API. But there's, you can add, add as many of those templates as you like. Um, there are some, some small constraints on how the playbooks operate because they also have to be able to interact with, there's a layer that has to be able to interact with Terraform to provision the infrastructure, um, which we've written. But you have to basically expect your Terraform outputs from that stage have to have a particular shape for, as, for, for the code that we've written to be able to adopt them into the Ansible inventory. And then from then on, it can be any Ansible that you like. Yeah, so, so yeah. there's a minimal set of assumptions about inputs and outputs. Yeah. Um, there's also the metadata for the, for the form. When a user wants to create a cluster, um, something has to provide the list of questions and parameters uh, yes. for that form. Um, but otherwise, yes, it, it's intended to be extensible. Yeah, so um, the bit Stig was talking about there is uh, it's probably easier to find it on here, actually. Go for it. Uh, so, this form here, um, this form is customizable on a per cluster type basis. And it, the way this form is, the way the content of this form is defined is using a, a YAML file that lives in the same Git repository as the playbook. So. Yep. So the question there was, are we planning to do first class support for bare metal for the batch clusters? And we could equally do it for Kubernetes as well. So, um, yep, the answer is yes. I mean, in really the, the integrations between um, the sort of platform services that Azimuth provides and the infrastructure beneath it, um, whether the nodes are bare metal or not is sort of wrapped up inside the infrastructure anyway. Um, so um, there isn't any special consideration that I'm aware of, other than, you know, it takes a little while longer to make them um, for, for bare metal nodes in these systems. So the, the idea there is that you, if you selected a bare metal flavor for your workers, you would get bare metal hosts. Yeah, so, yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.